<laughs> and through all of my experience and all that I have. Never replicated. You're listening to the all-new KDLU Radio Network. Blue Raven Network. When you have to shoot, shoot, don't talk. Scott Enster Network. Just kind of an open forum tonight, even though uh, I want to talk about a few things of <clears throat> of conducting yourself in these last days. And what I mean is that many people have already been to hell and back. Many people have already been through life-changing circumstances that have caused post-traumatic stress, that have put a bad taste in your mouth about relationships or church or or different companies that you've worked for. But every day is a new day, and that's an old saying, obviously, if some of you have been around long enough. But it's also what we make it. <clears throat> now, what I mean by that is you can be under a great tyranny, you can be under curses, you can be under demonic attack, but it's still what we make of it. <clears throat> and uh, so I want to just kind of go over some of that, and then I'll be checking the uh, the chat room and just see if you got any questions. Uh, but before I get into that, uh, again, I want to thank everyone for supporting the ministry. You know, I've got this uh, Scott Henson Network I still do on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then Julie and I on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays do the Tinfoil Hat Club. And that is a little bit more of addressing the Illuminati, the occult, Luciferianism. We as Christians to be um, um, familiar with it what's really going on, how they're pulling the wool over our eyes, and basically what to do about it. Now, when I, when I discuss with her, Julie, the, the issues, um, she, we're, we're really focusing now on reaching out to the lost. Now, I, I still do these shows for those who are still interested, and even for those who are non-Christian, uh, this is good information to to comprehend the battle uh, that we're in. Because no matter who you are, uh, Satan hates you. And and so I've made the statement, we're all in this together, and, and we, we truly are. But there is a separation for those who are uh, servants of Jesus Christ. And, and sometimes the, the, the water's a little bit muddy, and I'm not sure who's who anymore. Um, I've um, I've completely decided to do remove myself again in, in a public sense locally here. Um, I've made the attempt to to reach out and do things, uh, and and once again it was disastrous. It always has been. It's been this way for the past 16 years. And you say, well, why? Well, you know, I don't fight just my demons. I don't fight any generational just on myself with issues. I fight your demons. I fight your generational curses. I deal with, with those things out there that would wish to remove me so I don't fight your demons with you. I know, not as I said for you, but with you. Because you have to learn how to fight. And to hell and back is where I have been. I come from uh, a situation that caused me to write my first book, Borderline Personality Disorder, which that issue is at an all-time high. It's also the basis of Jezebel, and those who do not understand, believe, or comprehend 
Well, um, just keep listening, because in time you'll start putting the pieces together. Now, the devil doesn't do anything new. He keeps doing the same thing over and over again. But we as humans have a lack of remembrance. We tend to forget history, and so there we are destined to to relive it again. So going to hell and back, sometimes over a couple of years, you can drop your defenses and literally be put back into that position again. And I've talked to many, many people over the years that that is the case. Now, the devil, the demons, those of the fallen angels, are very intelligent, very sly, and their entrapment, their pegis, their snare, their ability to hook you, comes in all different ways, many different ways. And that means that you may think that you're immune to to the devil. You may think that you do not have problems. But this is what I found, okay? And as the saying goes, you can't run into the devil running the same direction. You have to counter him. You have to oppose him. Now, when you finally start opposing him and you say, well, I've been doing that, okay, well, really? Um, So, and I want to address that too here. And what I mean is that, and, and I know you probably get tired of me saying this, but the Great Commission. Now, what that means is we're to do those things that Jesus has commanded us in Matthew 28, 26. <coughs> and when I, when I say that, what he said is to keep my commandments, to do those things until I return. So then we look at the scriptures, we look at the New Testament, and all those things that Jesus told us to do, we're supposed to keep. Now, the, the church that calls itself a Christian church denies that. You say, well, no, they don't. Yes, they do. I, I'll, I'll tell you, it, it's amazing <clears throat> over the past years, again, trying to, to bring back, you know, trying, trying to bring deliverance into these churches and trying to do this and trying to do that, is absolutely futile. futile. Um, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to stick with the broadcast. I'm going to stick with with uh, deliverance and and you know continuing those things that uh, help educate. But I'm not going to step foot into a church anymore. And I say that because the churches are on an old, on a whole, and and many of you may be offended, but you know I'm after all of these years and getting slapped across the face and lit lit on fire and and everything else. Um, if if the Holy Spirit speaks to me to cast out demons, if if I get it in my spirit that I'm to do those things that we are commanded, and there's no question that that's what I'm supposed to do, then why is the church not doing that? Do you understand? Okay, and you, and you can make all kinds of excuses just like I did. I made all kinds of excuses. Well, they just don't know. They'll come around. At least I'll get to a few of them. Um, no, it doesn't work that way. Okay, now many of you that are in the church understand what I'm saying and agree, and you don't want to leave a church because you've you're you you've been doing it so long. Um, it's you think it's the way you're being fed, and in some ways you do. But um, in whole, if you were to really sit down next to the person, and, you know, to go to sit in the pew, and turn to the one to the to the left to the right. And, you know, tell them what you think. Tell them what you believe. If you're listening to my show and, and you agree with the stuff that we teach, and, and you, you know, if you're listening, you, you usually do, um, they'll think you're nuts. They'll think you're crazy. They'll think you've absolutely lost your mind or that you're demon-possessed or you're so ignorant that you just don't know the Word of God. Now, I've actually had pastors tell me, when I explain deliverance, they say, well, my God is bigger than that. Really? Y- your God? Okay, y- your God's bigger than that. Hmm. Well, you see, I never saw any deliverance after Jesus Christ. Really? Paul? How about Paul the Apostle? You know, I did a teaching Tuesday to reaffirm that Paul's teachings, his epistles, need to stay in. Okay, because there, there is a, a, a asserted effort to remove him. And you'll find that all roads lead to Zionism. 
and if if they can get Paul's teachings out of the out of the uh, uh, canons, out of the New, New Testament, then they they will be very happy. Now, why? Well, as I mentioned, Paul, being a vessel of Jesus Christ, being one who has been set aside and trained in the Spirit, he spent time with Jesus. God gave him special uh, skills of of the spirit realm. And so as he wrote, as he moved around and taught and trained and did what he was called to do, he brought people up to speed. He he And he himself had to deal in war with things. Now, again, the great commission of Jesus Christ will trump anything that anyone says that we're not, we aren't to do deliverance. See, that's the other thing, period. If Jesus says to continue those things, then, then by golly, that's what we do until his return. So there's no question about it. So the fact that any church denies, doesn't, does not want to go along with the plan, then you have to wonder why. And I mentioned that there's the potential of absolute ignorance and or you're doing it on purpose. And I've come to the conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, that they're doing it on purpose. I have no doubt now. I'm sorry. I wish I could say something different, and I've, I've you know, alluded that statement before, and I'm going to be making it again, but I'm done. And I also believe that there, there's a door that has closed to a lot of people. Those who are in the church, those who've been denying the commandments, those who've been disobedient, those who have been rebellious, and they're the ones that will tell you that they're the God-fearing people. They'll tell you they love Jesus. They'll tell you all this stuff, but yet they're not doing anything to serve the kingdom. And so there's a point, just as Jesus said, you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. And I'm, I'm sorry, I think that's already taken place to a point. Okay, how, that, how, how the numbers roll, I have no idea. But I, get, I do get it in my spirit, and, and, um, and, I'm, and I'm starting to see it come to pass. And I'll tell you why. Because the infestation, the concentration, the strength, the numbers of the demons that are affecting Christians. Notice I said Christians, because I do not do deliverance on non-Christians. Now, I will witness. I will, I will pray. And, and if there's anything that can be broken off that would be like a hindering or blocking spirit to keep them from receiving Jesus, if I get a word from the Holy Spirit to do that, then I will do that. In fact, recently I have just done that. And so at this point, then we then come to the comprehension and understanding that, the God, that God's Word is truth. God's Word is for everybody, okay? Because what we, what we see, too, is some will say, well, gee, these books were uh, written to only the Jews. These books were only written to the Gentiles. And as I showed, that all is good for teaching, reproof, Okay. So when we segregate, when we divide, then we divide the people. Now, how many times have you, let's say, bought something like a computer, and you got a manual, and the manual is just just the side of being worthless? Whoever wrote it really didn't care, either wasn't knowledgeable, or they, they were on a, such a tight budget that the guy only got an hour to do it, or gal. And so you had to learn the hard way, trial and error. And then, and, you know, a year goes by, and then all of a sudden on, you know, on a blog or, or you went to a friend's house or they came over and they did something on the computer that made what you've been doing so much easier. And you say, wow, I wish I had known that. I, you know, I, all that time I wasted cut and pasting and this and that when I could have done control this and control that, you know. And, and the point of it is that our lives would be so much simpler if the true word of God had been taught to us by the church. Now, it's our responsibility, it's our job to read the word. We're to be Bereans. We're to search the scriptures daily. We're to test the spirit, okay? So, but... But when you have teachers, when you have evangelists, when you have prophets, when you have those who are supposed to be pastors, and, I, and I've mentioned before that a pastor is not supposed to be in front of the church. 
say, well, Scott, no, this is man's tradition. Tell me, show me where it says to do that. And you're not going to find it. What it tells us is there should be a board of elders. Okay, so we're already off to a bad start. So now you got somebody who's in cahoots, who's in bed with the New World Order, and I'm sorry because I've told you that I've come to the conclusion that at this point in time in the game, because look how close we are here, that if they're still continuing business as usual, then they're doing it on purpose. And that means that you're being lied to. That means the destruction of you, your your loved ones, those things that, that have worth to you are going to be in jeopardy. Mm-hmm. Not a good not a good thing, is it? So many of you don't know how to war. Many of you have never really prayed. You think you pray, but sometimes your prayers are empty. There's no power behind them. Anyone ever come across that? Oh, I see that all the time. Now, um, as a teacher, as someone that brings information to somebody to help you understand or to comprehend something, uh, a lot of it is, is based on my view, and my view, which has been altered and changed over the years because of deliverance, because of casting out demons and literally seeing the spirit realm, the demonic, the way they think, the way they act, uh, the personality behind these particular spirits, and they all have different personalities. They all have a goal, a common goal. So you can have two people who are enemies, but they will come together for a time to take a third enemy out. And then once that's done, now World War II is going to be like that, by the way. If, if uh, the, the Germans or the Japanese had prevailed, eventually those two would have stood off to each other. Period. Okay? Period. So we need to understand that that division that's created by bad teaching through doctrines, doctrines that are man's, that were influenced by demons, so therefore they are a doctrine of demons. I'm sorry, the pre-trib is a doctrine of demons. Predestination is a doctrine of demons. Those things of, of prosperity doctrines are a doctrine of demons. And the reason is, is because it takes your eyes off of Jesus. I've said it before. I didn't originally coin it, but it's Jesus plus nothing. And so when you bring in all these other things, then your mind is clouded. You get, you get uh, drawn. Now, you know, just like uh, the epistles, we're told that, you know, if you burn with lust, if you burn with desire, then marry. But wishing that you didn't, because then you could focus yourself as an individual single more time to the kingdom. Because once you're in a relationship, you're taking care of someone else, you know, their, their emotional needs and physical needs and all the other things. And so by being single, such as myself, I've been this way now for 16 years, that uh, this is what I do. I live and breathe it. I live and breathe it. I, I go to bed doing this, and I wake up doing this. And through all that I have experienced and all that I have seen all these years, it has formed my opinion. It has educated me. Uh, you ever heard the saying, they're educated beyond their intelligence? Okay. I believe that that's what the church is. The church is educated beyond their intelligence because they've been fed all this particular uh, nonsense that has nothing to do with the end days on what we're called to do. Okay? We need to be prepared. We need to be ready. So as a teacher, that's what I've been trying to do. Okay? Now, in that, everything that I've done, I've been deciphering, and Julie's been doing a lot of deciphering on the occult. So if you haven't had a chance to get to Tinfoil Hat Club on Blog Talk, the other channel, so there's two basic channels, this one, Scott Henser Network, and Tinfoil Hat Club. Uh, she's been taking all the false flags, all of the events, those things of the occult numbering, those things of Jamatra, those things that are hidden in plain sight, and bringing to us that information <coughs> that shows that these shootings, whether it's Orlando or Dallas or whatever, they're staged. They're all false. They're lies. And it's part of the 
uh, deception to cause us to think that we need to do gun control. It's to, to cause us into a panic that thinks that, okay, well, the only one who's going to protect us is the government. The whole thing. And so, so along with teaching is a tremendous amount of deciphering. And in that deciphering, I have come to the conclusion that the really only real thing we can do is what we call counterinsurgents or counterinsurgency. And what that means is that when, when in or before the devil comes in and does his thing, and sure as the sun's going to rise tomorrow, that happens. That will happen. And in that, then we take countermeasures. We come in and do preemptive strikes. Now, what does that mean? Let's say that you buy a house, and you have absolutely no idea what took place in that house. You know what I'm surprised about? The, the last house I bought, the real estate agent, I turned and I, f I had a really weird feeling about the house. And, and I eventually found out what was going on and I was able to deal with it. But I turned and I said, was anybody murdered here? And they turned to me and said, I'm not required to tell you that. I don't have to tell you that by law. Did you know that? Now, that may be a state thing. I don't know. <laughs> but... I just looked at him and said, well, you know what? You're the wrong real estate agent. Uh, because if I ask you a question, I expect an answer. And if someone's been murdered in here, then that's pretty pretty significant to me and what I need to, need to know on how to deal with this place. Now, uh, it turns out that there was a death. It wasn't murder, but it was a slow suicide. Okay? And so if you, some of you may not know what that is, but basically drinking yourself to death or not taking care of yourself intentionally because you've given up. That's a suicide. Okay, soft suicide, slow suicide. Now, in our counterinsurgency, so, so otherwise me knowing that that house <clears throat> now has, has their spirits in it, and obviously they're not good spirits because they would still be alive if they were, then I need to go in and clean that house. Now, it needed a cleaning anyways, and it's one of the reasons I got it so cheap, but I was willing to do that. And, but I'm talking about spiritual cleaning. So I went in and encountered insurgency before they had a chance to pounce on me in my first night staying there, and I went in and I anointed the place. I got oil, which had frankincense in it, and I went around and I warred and I prayed and I broke and I threw it and I cast out and you name it, I did it. And I literally, I want you to listen to me. Now I had, I, it was kind of my therapy house. Um, it was, it was an old historic home. It was a registered historic house that that was a fixer upper, but it had been basically intact. The floors were still good, you know, and and you know because the wooden floors, some of them are really bad, but no, these these were pretty good. So it had worth, it had value. And I went in and just labored and did this and did that, learned a little bit more about carpentry. And, you know, my, my basic background was electrical electronics, so electrician work was nothing. You know, some interesting plumbing things, putting an old clawfoot tub back in and putting, you know, bring the kitchen back to look like it did in the 1920s. And, and it, was, it was a lot of fun. So when I was finally done and I did an open house to the people at the church, when they came, did you know nobody wanted to leave? The house was at such peace. People were so comfortable that they felt so protected. They were, they were in an in a environment that they would not get at home. They were in an environment they weren't getting somewhere else. And I will guarantee you, you know, I did a lot of praying there, and I did a lot of deliverance in between getting the house ready because it didn't just happen overnight. But the point of it is, is I kicked out all the demons. I broke all the curses. I made things not, um, uh, you know, it, I made an environment that was non-threatening. And the way that I did it is through counterinsurgency. Now, obviously... Whoever was in that house was to hell and back prior to me. So the, the whole point of this show is regardless of all the stuff that we, I'm going to talk about and what we have talked about, there is victory. 
Because no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the condition of something is, then if God's in the middle of it, if you invite him, if you, you, you are obedient and you do those things you've been divinely called to do in his divine direction, it's a win-win. And that house was a win-win. And I ended up selling it just as the market was topping out, and that was a good thing, and that's what I, that was what I used to, to move here to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. So, so again, that was a preemptive strike. I made sure that I took care of them before they took care of me because the last thing I wanted to do was wake up with something on my chest and choking me. And a lot of you have recently uh, have told me that. Now, again, a curse. A curse is something in a family, on an individual, that is something that repeats. So you can have curse of stillborn. You can have curse of divorce. You're going to have a curse of cancer. You can have a curse of, um, of mental disorder. You can have a curse of poverty. You can have those things that uh, uh, continue to bring you into a bad relationship. And, of course, the, the typical generational curse would be like alcoholism, addictions, uh, those things. You know, again, I mentioned divorce you know, being married several times. But when when you have a family bloodline that has been in the occult, that practiced Freemasonry, that was one who actually dedicated themselves to Satanism or something along that lines, we see that these curses go to the third and fourth generation. Now, whenever you have those who are in, out of wedlock that 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 come together and consummate and and, uh, and and you have you know a child born out of that okay then you have a child that's born under the curse uh, of Deuteronomy 23 the curse of the bastard now in that it says that those who are born out of wedlock under those conditions now you got to remember this is the old testament uh, will not inherit the kingdom of god now the good news is is that Jesus Christ paid for all past, present, and future sins. So therefore, we have light at the end of the tunnel. We have the ability to come in and counterinsurgents to bring in and make sure that that child is not going to have to go through hell and back. That by breaking those curses and setting them free, they then are able to have a normal life. Now, when we say normal, again, we're talking about those that are now deficient of bad relationships, of poverty, those things of, you know, all the divorces and, and uh, suicide, early death, premature death, those uh, of addictions, you know, all that stuff. When, whenever that's not there to bombard somebody, you've got to fight in chance, okay? And in that, then hopefully, you know, whatever the direction they choose to go, and hopefully that is to be one to serve Christ, they can be used quite mightily. And, the, and that is the goal for the last days. You know, God wishes that none should perish. And so, again, I have to go back to the church and say, well, why are you not breaking the curses off of your congregation? Because many of them are sick and asleep among you. Now, let me, as I get into that, let me bring that up. 1 Corinthians 11.30, and it's interesting because that actually came up today. And what it is is that it's a curse from God for those who take communion improperly those who are blasphemous about the way that they take it let's say you come in drunk into church and it's time to do communion and you partake in it okay you've come in a state of mind that you're not ready to submit yourself before the lord and or you got a big fight out in the parking lot and you called you know your spouse of so and so and or that night prior you were watching pornography and you come in, and you're not, uh, you're not preparing yourself. You're not cleaning yourself. You're not getting ready to receive communion. Okay? And so, again, 1 Corinthians 11.30, uh, many are, sleep, are sick and asleep among you. What is okay, I want you to look that up, and I want you to understand that that's an actual curse placed on by God. So there are curses that do come from God himself because of what you've done. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not. You blaspheme the Holy Spirit, that's big stuff. 
Now that in itself, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which there is no redemption, uh, is a very serious matter. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> now, when we talk about poverty, we, you know, uh, again, and I've mentioned this before, that, you know, you, you get a couple of dollars saved away and the car breaks and there goes the money and you're, you're actually in the hole again, another hundred dollars. So no matter what you do, you're always behind. Okay? That's a curse. Sorry, but it is. You need, you need to understand that. It needs to be broke off of you. So that can come through the generational curses, just like the curse of the bastard, and that goes to the tenth generation. Okay? So, so we need to go back, like a counterinsurgents, go back and, and get rid of these things. Cut them things out of your life. Okay? Now, infirmities, infirmities can... can you know, come in all types. You can have those things of, of heart disease, diabetes, um, cancers, uh, different things that paralyze you, different things that, uh, you know, keep you from, from being able to be mobile, being able to be active, being able to, to do the things you've been called to do by God. So, so many of those are curses, and they're overlooked really easy, Okay. And, and w the sad thing of it is, is that through the blood of Jesus Christ, those things can be taken care of. Now, when it comes to um, addictions, addictions come in many forms. And, and I've had some of you call, and you want to quit smoking. Well, then quit smoking. Because what I've noticed over the years, that until you're ready to quit smoking, it doesn't matter how many demons I cast out of you, um, you're going to continue to smoke. So that is a decision that you make, Okay. Now, there can be those addiction demons that prod you. There can be those things of withdrawal demons. But you see, if you resist the devil, he will flee. And so, again, no matter what we do, until you make a decision, that's the way it's going to be. And, and I have found that women are more, more apt to uh, not quit smoking when, no, no, no matter what I do. Okay? Now, let's, uh, let's assume... Let's say that you've been assaulted. Let's say that you've been mugged. Let's say that you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, that particular assault, that particular action against you can actually cause an open door because of the trauma. There may have been fear involved. There, and, and, and the people who did it may have been part of a, a, um, an occult action, not just a gang action, now, the, those in gangs can be in the occult, too. That can be part of that. But in that can bring a curse. Now, you didn't do anything. You were a victim. But, see, the devil doesn't play fair. So many of you that have been beat up, many of you that have been robbed and jumped and, and so forth, um, have something on you that needs to be broken, okay? An act of violence, trauma, um, those things of... Um, it's almost a betrayal of society, okay? You're walking along, you're minding your own business, you're enjoying, you know, the, the beautiful scenery, and someone jumps out behind the tree, and next thing you know, you wake up on the ground, your wallet's gone, and you got, you know, you got a busted skull. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and, and so now you're scared to go out. Now you're scared to look, to, to even walk past the tree. So now you have a phobia. Now you have post-traumatic stress. Now you have a fear, okay? You see how that works? And the devil's always in the details. Now, murder, murder is another thing. Um, murdering spirits, they're, they're on a leash, and thank goodness. And they only get released when sin is created, when sin is, is, uh, is, is accomplished, is done. Now, what I mean by that is that when, when you have different sins, not all sins lead to death. When you have an, an occurrence or a circumstance such as homosexuality, such as different types of perversion, even those of abortion, anything, and, and by the way, because, because of uh, genitalia being involved with abortion, any time that those areas are violated, any time that those areas are um, brought into a circumstance such as that, um, that is a form of, 
that is an abomination. Okay, and 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 what I mean is that your body's been violated. Okay, and in that violation, a murder took place, which means abortion. <clears throat> now that can mean that the spirit of a, of a, of murder is now in the family, but it's also tied. Okay, because here's the other thing. Um, let, let's say that you have a rape take place, and unfortunately. Uh, a double thing can happen is that maybe a woman becomes pregnant from the rape. Well, now this is now this is an unwanted child. This was non-intent, and if the if the you know depending on the mother, everyone's different. Um, then the, the rejection of the fetus. <coughs> so, the, so the baby now is under a curse of rejection, but also under a curse of molestation and a curse of rape. Okay, and since that it did did not take a place in marriage, and sometimes that does, the you know the rape does, um, then you have the curse of the bastard. So do you see how such acts can be so violent on a long term? Because now everybody that's involved with this is going to suffer, and the child is going to suffer. The child can be orphaned. The child can be aborted. The child can be rejected. I mean, it, it just it just goes on and on and on, and and some of you out there are are from that, and some of you that were um, adopted and didn't really know your parents, and you haven't done a background check, you, you might be under that circumstance, and now and now you're wondering, well, wait a minute, if if that's what happens to people in this situation, boy, my life sure parallels what what Scott just said. Maybe I better look into that. And so, again, what Jesus Christ did on the cross, past, present, and future, is resolved through his sacrifice. But you need to take the necessary steps, like a counterinsurgence, to come forward and do those things. That's why we have the commandments of Christ. Okay? Now, when we have a, a death of a loved one, especially if a murder is involved and they were murdered, Okay, that in itself, the trauma, the loss, uh, again, a betrayal of society, the, the, the very act of that particular type of violence can be absolutely devastating to the uh, surviving spouse. Okay, um, and let's say that it's a child that was murdered. Um, you know, and, and, and or you're uh, a young adult and your parents were murdered. You know, there there was a an instance years ago, quite a few years ago now, and I was doing a, some contract work and had come in and, and did some electrical and I had to come back and finish it up and then do a, a power-up to demonstrate it to the customer that it worked. And the first time that I met the, uh, the manager, um, he was a, a, a very nice man, uh, very well spoken, very very well uh, poised in his mannerism. And the next time I saw him, he when he pulled up and got out of his car, I didn't see the same person. What I saw was a very sickly, broken individual that I almost didn't recognize. And what had happened in the time from when I first met him to then. Um, he found his parents murdered, and the murderer wrapped him up in, in uh, like glad uh, plastic, wrap you know wrapped him up and put him in the closet, and he had to go unwrap him to verify that it was his parents. And <clears throat> so you can imagine the trauma that this man faced, and the toll that it took on him when I saw him was absolutely amazing. So that in itself, with the trauma that takes place by experiencing such a thing, that the violent act that was committed onto the parents, and now that they're dead, <coughs> that any spirits that the parents had were free to move on to him. Okay, so he got a double whammy. Okay, do you, do you understand how violent acts of murder and so forth are so devastating? So there's no win-win in any of that. People that are involved in that, and some of you can relate, some of you are widows, some of you have experienced that, 
that the tremendous amount of, of trauma that comes from this, again, it's a, a betrayal of, from society, that um, the phobias, because now you're terrified that it can happen to you. You, you now realize that how vulnerable you are because now you lost your spouse who, who would have been your protector, right, and, as, as one of the examples. And so now you have phobias. Now, now you live in fear. Okay, so, so you see how these things are curses because you didn't have that before. You know, you might have been a strong-willed person, and, and this broke you. This took you down to a level uh, that you never thought you could go. And you literally get drug uh, from hell and back. Your life is hell, and 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 so and then you have those that that aren't very sympathetic, those who are actually, uh, and, and I hate to say it, but I see this in the church too. Um, I can just see some nincompoop saying, "Well, what did you do to deserve it? What open doors do you have that caused your spouse to be murdered?" You know. If I hear that from somebody, I'm going to bitch slap them. I'm sorry. Because what you have done, you have taken one of the biggest daggers from hell, and you have lodged it through their chest. So in the name of Jesus Christ, never say that to anybody. You be a man or woman of God, and you comfort them, and you love them. Okay? You let God sort it out. You're not, when, we, you know, you're so quick to, to say about judging. Don't judge, don't judge this. When we are called to judge, but that is a circumstance, and until you understand what's going on, do not do such a thing. And if anyone out there has ever had that done to you, I am sorry. And I know that it has. Because I get some of you in here, and some of the stuff I've heard from the church absolutely is horrifying. Some of the comments of the disposable men and women of God that have absolutely slammed their brother and sister in Christ in their, in their worst hour. So you, now you're understanding why I don't go to churches anymore? All right. Now, bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is another issue. Um, again, this can be a willful act of somebody that committed a crime against you that took your money, and now you don't have any money. You weren't able to make deadlines. Um, maybe there was... Uh, uh, a, bus a bad business transaction, and you had an opponent, a upcoming business that was trying to be competition, did some dirty-handed things and took your business away from you, and you lost everything because you put everything on the table. Everything was on the line. You know, you rolled the dice, and you lost. Now, there's two ways to look at that. Um, one, you may not have should not have been in the business in the first place. Maybe God wasn't leading you there, but you just thought you could make a quick buck. Okay. Or the other is that your business actually had worth that could have meant that in your prosperity, you could have supported ministries. You could have taken care of a widow. You could have taken care of some orphans. Do you understand? So you would have done something with that money that had something to contribute to the kingdom of God. And so the devil ran interference with you. So I want you to know that if you're in depression and a, and a failed business deal, you don't understand what happened and everything that you did was correct. You may have just fell victim to a, a, um, a counter by the devil. When I say the devil, I'm talking about demons, to keep you from being prosperous. So don't blame yourself. You may have just fallen victim to that. Now, you may have a curse that needs to be broken, and or uh, the, the opposition or people that may have been ex-employees. Maybe the, you even had somebody that you hired that actually was a plant, and so there was a self-destruction within your company. But the other is charismatic witchcraft. Now, I, I want to talk about this. Charismatic witchcraft is done by the, the mainstream church. And what that means, that since our, our tongue is a two-edged sword, the, the words that we speak can cut. They can bring life or death. They can bring blessings or curses. And so you have people then that think or, or have been brought in that by the devil because their behavior is destruction anyways. That's, you know, you see these church splits, 
Um, sure enough, there's usually a married couple in there somewhere that was the problem. Jezebel, Ahab, uh, working as a tag team, come in and they, they take down a church and they split it. Well, they can do the same thing to companies. And so you have somebody who's praying, supposedly praying to God, and in their prayers, they're actually cursing you. And so that's called charismatic witchcraft. So what they've done, instead of blessing you, instead of uh, bringing in you know, divine guidance and, and, uh, and those things of prosperity to be for the kingdom of God, they're saying things that would be destructive to, to be counter uh, to what you're doing. And as subtle as it may be, that maybe there's already demons involved, maybe there's just, that was the one straw that broke the camel's back. That does happen, all right? Now, repossession. Now, that's another thing that is incredibly humbling, to, to lose a house, to have a car towed away, uh, to even have, you know, let's say a building of, of your business to be closed because you couldn't uh, make, the, make the mortgage on it. Um, when it comes to repo, again, what, what you can have is a defining of you in the negativity. Now, what I mean by that is that you lose your self-worth. You see yourself as a failure. Now, I'm talking about those who care. Some people, some of you, or some don't care. Okay, you go out and you run the credit cards really high, and you do this and that, and you squander money, and you're not being careful, and you could really care less. But those who, who have integrity, those who care, those who are responsible, that when this happens, this can be a very difficult time because uh, it's, almost, it's almost like being robbed. Have you ever been come home or, or walked up to your car and the windows broke and your handbag or computer or camera or your cell phone's missing? You've been violated, and you feel extremely violated. And, and so when this happens, you know, like repossession, it's almost like a violation. And, and that can be very damaging and wounding to the soul. And, and so, again, the, the devil's always in the details. And it may have been brought to that repo was brought up because of what took place in the spirit. Now, IRS, the tax, oof, you know, that, that's a sore one, right? We all have to deal with it. And, uh, you know, as we've learned and as we've educated ourselves over the years, um, none, of, none of really what the, the IRS is doing is legal. None of it is constitutional. None of it is sanctioned by God. Now, there's certainly things that we need to do to take care of a structure of, a, of an institution, such as a government, that is there to, to be for the people, to protect the shores, to assure that there are things that are kept in place to keep the peace, that's understandable. But literally, when a person who labors all day then has to give up his earnings and then, and then a percentage a little more each year, uh, that's theft. Okay? And, and so the IRS can literally destroy people. Now, a few years ago, I don't know how many years ago, maybe it's been 20 years ago, um, one of the TV programs did some underground investigation, and literally some of the IRS agents would come in in the morning and sit down at their desk and go, hmm, I wonder whose life I can destroy today. Literally, they would say that. And there were, there, there were case after case of people who committed suicide because the IRS rattled their cages for so long and drug them through the mud and, and took things from them that they lost their self-worth and they couldn't live any longer. They were so humiliated. They were so, um, you know, brought to a point of destruction that they just ended it all. And always leaving somebody behind, okay? Now, demonization. Demonization and possession, as I've mentioned before, are two separate things. Now, <clears throat> they can be interchangeable, but they're two separate things. Demonization is an individual who has demons that reside in their body, that reside in their minds, okay? Demon possession uh, is, is an ownership, okay? You possess something. 
And, and so as a Christian, your spirit, which you've dedicated to Jesus Christ because you're a bondservant, right, your soul, that what happens is that the demons come in and they infest your body, <coughs> they get in your brain and your mind, and they can be in other various places. And, and so what that means is that you are demonized. You're not demon-possessed. And so that you now need a cleaning. You now need a healing. You, you need to have them cast out so you're not in, in that bondage of the demons or under the control. Now, when you have demon possession, you have somebody who is not in Christ. You are completely vulnerable. So otherwise, you are a house that has no locks. You are a apartment building that has left the windows open. And the demons come and go. Now, since you're not in Christ, what you'll find is that though there are people who deal, you know, that are very, um, very sick, uh, mental illnesses and all the other things. But what you'll find is that since these people are not in Christ, um, the devil already has them. So they're not going to be tormented as much. It's almost like the devil uses his resources. You know, uh, as we read Jubilees, what we find, the book of Jubilees, what we find, and you know, at Book of Enoch uh, complimenting it, that 10% of the demons that were created from before and after the flood, uh, from, from the sons of God coming into the daughters of man and creating giants, and that was an abomination. When they died, they became evil spirits. That 90% are bound right now. 10% are allowed to be free on the earth. Now, can you imagine that the chaos that we have right now and the problems that you've had in life with only 10%, could you imagine what happens when the other 90% is released? Okay. So what you have is a conservative effort of resources. That's one of the things I believe. Whether, whether it's true or not, I'm just going to go with it because it's the only thing that really makes sense right now. And what I mean is that you have people who are not serving God, so they're already going to hell. Okay. They have not uh, believed onto him, Jesus Christ. Now, You've noticed, some of you, that when you became a Christian, that all hell broke loose. You, you literally went to hell and back during a certain period of time uh, of your conversion to Christianity, to become, a, to become a bondservant. And what happened was the demons that were in you now become rebellious. They now want to torment you. They now... Uh, have a job to do, so to speak. Otherwise, they've been sitting around having a coffee break, and now they're, they're called back to work. So this is what happens. This is why it's so important to have deliverances in church. Now, I'm going to be um, talking uh, here pretty soon to someone that I know that was just recently here and had brought to my attention um, about water baptism. And I think a lot of us have been overlooking it a little, a little bit too much, and I want to and I'm going to start talking more about that. Um, in other countries where the, the demonic possession and demonization is, uh, is, is obvious, because they see the spirits all the time, that uh, what I've been finding from, from his information, that after a baptism, that many people throw up. Now, hacking up a demon is one of the ways that demons come out. So I'm going to assume that the regurgitation, or whatever you want to call this, the demonstration of hydraulics, is the expulsion of demons because of the water baptism, which is in the order of things, that once you come to Christ, then you're water baptized. And the church doesn't really do that. Now, those who do do baptism, it's the order of things, and the way they do it is more scripted. It's more corporate. It's more, almost like... Uh, uh, you know, you got to do this and you got to do that and we'll baptize you. Then instead of coming in the spirit, coming in the reality that you want to enter into relationship, big difference, huge difference. So I want to talk uh, a little bit more about that. So, again, remember, demon possession are those people who are not in Christ and or they have made a commitment to Satan. They have sold their souls, so to speak. Okay and that their spirits will be uh, thrown into the lake of fire. Now, there is a point in time where there, there is no uh, return. 
uh, you can be turned over, okay, to to uh, to the tormentor forever. So as I mentioned, that the the door's been closed on some things, and how that's going to work out, um, we'll just have to see. <coughs> But the point of it is, is I have been saying in, in my ministry as I've been doing this, that as long as you draw breath, you can repent and come to Jesus. But we're now getting towards a later date. So I need to rethink that now. I'm very concerned that for many, not necessarily you who are listening, because of the fact that you're listening, you get it. But many in the churches do not get it. So I'm going to have to rethink that and then come up with something that would be uh, more infra- informational about the situation. <laughs> now, I, I, with everything that I just got through saying, regardless of the circumstances, that we have victory, even if we die, because then we go to be with the Father. So that's a win-win, and I want you to understand that, okay? Always, always hold on to that. Now, While you're alive, there'll be restoration. There'll be restoring, okay? Um, Your countenance, the the joy can be brought back in. Uh, You're you're refurbished, your spirit, your mind. You're brought back into relationship with God. You get the demons out. Now you can think clearly. Now you're not under religious oppression. You're able to, to hear the Holy Spirit. And in that itself, it brings restoration. You're restored. Uh, it's just a wonderful time. Uh, so <clears throat> it's, it's a, a new reconditioning of you. You're being reconditioned. I mentioned about new wine skin, new wine and new wine skins. Okay? Now, the other is that through, through deliverance and, and, and coming to Christ and back into relationship, we start to see the worth of our family. We start to see how much uh, we really do care about our spouse, how much they have for us, that they're really, they really are there as a gift of God. Now, some of you have a hard time believing that because you've got some tough marriages, but the devil's always in the detail in a tough marriage. And that means that the programming that was put into you when you were young can manifest later in years. One of the great books that can teach, that can uh, orchestrate that is called Skeletons in the Closet. And it, you know, it's, a, it's a basically about those women who have been uh, mistreated as children, whether it was a you know, um, molestation or so forth, and they stuff it down, and they get into a marriage, and 10 years into the marriage, uh, the, the husband doesn't even know who she is anymore because now those hurts and wounds have come to the surface, and, and they've got a nasty bite. And so we have to be very careful about that, that we do not allow the devil to have a place. And okay, that's one of the things about resisting the devil. But it, again, it shows you how important deliverance is. Now, if deliverance had been, had been done in that generation when that happened, that the perpetrator that did that to, to, the, to the, the girl wouldn't have happened because he would have been delivered. Okay, you see how them not doing deliverance over the years has put us in a situation that around every corner can be a very bad situation. Now, you know, I, I used to uh, wonder why my, my uh, kids' mother was so pr- protective, um, you know, because I was a kid. You know, I, I mean, I played in the front yard, and I'd, go, I'd walk miles and ride my bike everywhere. But it was just the grace of God I never got abducted. And, and I kind of had that mindset when I was raising my kids, but then, but slowly I started to see that, you know what, it's a bad, bad world out there, and there are those who want to take little girls. And so we have to, you know, we, I, I learned, I learned. And now um, when I see kids out playing, I, I just kind of cringe. And, you know, and how sad. This is supposed to be a country, uh, uh, an environment that we should be free and, and able to move about without that uh, hindering Norris. And, and if the church had done what it was supposed to do, it would have been that, okay? Because children, are, are, their worth alone, their spirit, uh, who they are, uh, the, the, the wonderful experience of taking somebody from the very beginning and, and training and teaching them and getting them to a, to a place that they can be a servant of God. And believe me, there's crowns in heaven for that. 
Now, many of us have dealt with things in life, and so you can't always say that about, you know, your teenagers or the, the, the daughter or son that you have now. But, you know, it's not too late. We See, that's the one thing about Christ. There's, there's grace. There's forgiveness. But it's for those who repent, okay? And then when we repent, we understand that we did wrong, and then we rectify it, okay? So, and it's our responsibility to maintain our walk. All right, well, I'm out of time. I hope that all makes sense to you. I, it was kind of off the cuff. I didn't get a lot of time to prepare today. I just kind of wanted to speak from the things that I've been seeing. But, you know, again, God loves you regardless. But at the same time, his law was written from day one. And if you're willfully going to be rebellious, if you're going to reject Christ, if you're going to be disobedient, um, then his, his hands are tied. Because in those laws, in those things of rules, that even though, even though Jesus fulfilled them, if you're going to sin in certain ways, if you're going to continue in your behavior, you'll be turned over to it. And we even see in Corinthians that a man had his father's wife, and it was described to turn him over to the devil for a time in hopes that his soul will be saved. And that's because in the torment, in, the, in those things that, um, that bring destruction, that can bring repentance. Now, it's obviously not across the board, because we see in the book of Revelation that people will actually still curse God instead of crying out to him. Now, as hard as that is to believe, we need to look at the world right now. There are people cursing God, and as far as I'm concerned, they're my enemy. Okay? They're my enemy, too, and we need to understand that. All right, God bless and good night to everyone. You're listening to the all-new KBOU.